so we are going to delve into, we're going to dive into the Ten Commandments. This thing has been so big in my spirit, it, it's just been, it, it's, I, I can't, it's nonstop. The different revelations that go through this particular group of words, these Ten Commandments. That leads me to believe that, and I have a gift for the obvious, then it must be important to God. There must be something about this that he wants us to understand and to hear. Uh, this will be an introduction, and then we're going to go through them one by one. And uh, again, like poor Cheryl, because <laughs> I'm like, oh, guess what? I just, i got to write this down. God just... It must be important to him that we talk about this subject at this hour and at this day. You know, we spent uh, we spent an hour and a half with this group of people and their you know incredible patience uh, and kindness to talk about eight things we're all going to be accountable for when we all stand before him, and that's a fact. I think he's given us a heads up. These are eight things you are going to be accountable for. Here's a heads up. It's like getting the the, the test results early. Yeah, you, know, you got the answers before the test even comes. Well, I believe that this Ten Commandments is very key to this entire story of standing in his presence. So, so we're going to talk about these Ten Commandments. Thou shalt not, thou shalt have no other God before me. I just hear like thunder. Mm. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven images. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. I'm telling you what, when we get to these, this, anyway. <laughs> Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. The revelation on this alone is worth the price of admission. Because we're going to talk about the Sabbath and what the Lord has showed me about the Sabbath. has just blown me away. Yes. Blown me away. Honor thy father and thy mother and thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor, and thou shalt not covet. Pretty simple words, right? We're done. We read them. We're good. Now let's jive in here and find out what the Father has to say about these ten commandments. Now, whenever we think about the ten commandments, as soon as I say the word ten commandments, for most of us, you know what the first thing that comes to our mind is? <laughs> I love the curtain. <laughs> I mean, of course, we're going to think about Charlton Heston and the Ten Commandments. And if you have not watched it, I mean, I spent many years, or at least once a year, I, I've watched the Ten Commandments. Ten Commandments and the movie Ben Hur. Both those love those movies. I've watched them at least once a year. What's interesting about this, uh, with these tablets that he's holding, these, these tablets actually co contain uh, uh, archaic or ancient Hebrew. This is the language that Moses would have written in. This, this, what you're seeing on the screen here, this is, what, this is how Hebrew was originally written up until 600 B.C. Up until the children of Israel went into Babylon. When the children of Israel went into Babylon, then they switched over to the block script that we see today in modern, modern Hebrew. But this is actually how they wrote it. Um, so it's, it's, sort of, it, it's really interesting. The first, the first letter, that's the first one, Aleph. And the next one is Lamed. And the next one is Hey. And, and in the book of uh, uh, um, Jubilees, uh, which is an apocryphal book, but one of the things that is said there is that the Lord taught Abraham, Abraham how to write this way. It's called Ivrit. If you go to Israel and you ask, what language do you speak in Israel? They'll say, we speak Ivrit. How do you spell that? Uh, I-V-R-I-T-E, Ivrit, I-V-R-I-T-E, Ivrit. So if you were to go over there and ask, what language do you speak? We speak Ivrit. Well, this, is, this was the Ivrit language. That was uh, written. So that's where the, that's the ancient Hebrew. As we get started here, it's like, wait a minute. We're going to talk about the Ten Commandments. Where did the Ten Commandments come from? I, I thought they were ten suggestions, <laughs> you know, or ten recommendations. Who? Where do these Ten Commandments come from? Well, they came from God. Well, now a lot of people in the world around us today, as soon as you say that, they're going to have a problem because they're going to be like. 
I don't believe in God. Right? So how do you know there is a God? I don't even know. How do we know? How do you know there's a God? Now, I know there's some scientists out there that could go through these long explanations. There's probably some theologians out there that could give you this big explanation. But for us, how do you know there's a God? How do you know, Cheryl? Um, two things. One is just that uh, this cannot be an accident, the way the world is made, how it functions, and how we, we're so close to the sun that um, we're born, but we're not burned up. And then the other one is because the Holy Spirit in me tells me there's a God. And I heard him the Holy Spirit speak. So. so the fact is, you can argue with science. You can argue with theologians. You can argue with denominations. But you can't argue with personal a personal testimony. So, John, how, how do you know there's a God? Prompted, I have inner unction. And I, I would have to share what Cheryl said that the uh, um, Holy Spirit is, is full on one, one third of the Trinity. So, he, uh, he makes us and causes us to have our being. And uh, I, he gives us conviction, and uh, all of these things, uh, you know, uh, are are evidence to me personally because of, mm -hmm. of how I live, right? What he does, what he does through me, and what he does through through you, you know, how he how he is with you, you folks, and so uh, that's that's how I know. How, I mean, as well as taking a look at, at a morning or a mountain. Or a river going by, or a fire that's burning that is ever changing. You know, it never is the same. And, and that in itself is like creating creation. So every religion, every single religion, other than this faith journey we live with Jesus, every religion on the earth postulates the possibility that there may be a supreme being, but to know him, you've got to follow these rules. So they automatically give you rules. And so they lay them down and say, now, if you will do these rules and do these rituals, then that will draw you in to uh, the uh, approval of this supreme being. Okay, You'll get his approval if you will do these things. But the bottom line is, in every one of them, and, and I and before I became a believer, I explored numerous ones of them, and I'm telling you something, every one of them was very subjective. It was based on my personal opinion. I feel like that makes sense. I, I, that makes sense to me. When they talk, when they would sit there and, and, and with the Buddhist and they would share the poetry, I thought the poetry was lyrical. I liked the poetry. I like the poetry. And so I like some of those nuances. They were, they were appealing to me. And so I kind of leaned into them. Some of the other things that I experienced were not appealing to me, to me. But every one of these things that we approach, when we approach these, every other religion, it is a very subjective experience between me and it. They pre I'm presented with certain doctrines, I'm presented with certain teachings, I'm presented with certain things about this particular faith system, and then it's up to me to say, I like that, so I'm going to lean into that. But it remains very subjective. But not the, very, the thing that is so amazing about this relationship with the Lord is I didn't choose him. I did not choose him. He chose me. He came after me. Something outside of myself. Something objective. Outside of my being. He came after me. That's a totally different experience. Yes. I didn't volunteer or sign up for a specific faith system or religion. I didn't come in and say, I'd like to sign up for that religion. I didn't do that. In this case, he came after me. Relentlessly coming after me. And times when I pushed him away, when some of his people that came and witnessed to me, and I, I was not a pleasant person with them, more than once I had to repent over and over again for how I treated some of his servants. You did not choose me, but I chose you, and I appointed you 
that you would go and bear fruit and that your fruit would remain so that whatever you ask of the Father in my name, he may give it to you. That's very different than every other faith system out there. The only experience unique from them all is this. Our Father, our Lord, chose us before we never, we didn't choose him. He came after us. And he continues to keep coming after us. You know, I, I've shared this before, but you know, I, I just, I'm constantly, even, even with what I went through in, in, with illness the last few days, it's like that has, how you feel physically has no effect on his love. Has no effect. It has no effect on the forward progress of the kingdom of God. Has no effect. You, you can be in the worst condition, and I felt pretty bad, <laughs> and, but doesn't change, absolutely does not change his timing, his plans, or his purposes. How I feel, or my mood, has no effect whatsoever. But he chose us. This makes us unique from every other, every other ism out there. I mean, you can look at Jainism, you can look at uh, uh, Zoroaster, um, you can look at Hinduism. You can look at any one of those. And they'll give you a, a booklet, and they'll tell you, this is how we do it. If you want to be a part of our thing, here's how you do it, okay? I, I, I like you, you're, you wear pink garments or robes. Or, I like that. Okay, I like to do that. So they give you a booklet. He comes after us with none of that. He just comes with love. It says, with relentless love, that says, I will not give up. I will not give up on you. I will continue to pursue you. Even when you backslide, even when you step your toe, even when you do some foolish thing, doesn't change my love for you. I will pursue you. And I want to pursue you until you come to the fullness of what I created you to be in the first place. Because that's what I want. I want you to be the absolute, complete fullness of who I created you to be. Every gift, every talent, every ability, everything I put inside of you, I want it to flourish, to have its 100% fulfillment inside of you. Isn't that incredible? Mm -hmm. That's radical. He pursues us. Sometimes when we're even running from him, That's he's right. still pursuing until we finally turn around and give up. And then he loves us to life and never judges us to death. All right, so one of the things we're going to talk about is the, the Torah. Uh, and oftentimes when people think of the Torah, they think of the first five books of the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, called the Pentateuch. But the fact is the word Torah literally means teaching or doctrine, direction, guidance, law. Law is a part of this. But when we say the word Torah, it has all of those elements built into that one word. So in one sense, you could say you could take hold the whole Bible and say that's the Torah, because it's teaching, it's guidance, it's, direct, it's direction. So you notice what he has in his hand? So you notice what they're using there, that little hand? It looks like a hand. Yeah, because it's called a yad, and uh, it's, it's actually very practical, because these, these, these scriptures are hand, uh, hand written with ink. Well, they are. They're all done this way. The ones in the synagogues, they're all done with this ink. So can you imagine putting, people putting their fingers on that ink yeah. and, and rubbing it around, and, the, and the, the material itself you know, would get worn out? So that's why they use this yad, um, so that they can point and touch what they're reading. Um, so uh, yeah, oh yeah, and then it's parchment. It's, so the, the material is parchment, so you can imagine if people were handling that with their hands, you know, so that's why they don't. So anyway, um, the law, the to let's talk about the law. Jesus called it the law of Moses. Jesus called it the law of Moses, so we'll call it the law of Moses. Because Moses is the one that received that law. And he received the law uh, on Pentecost. So when we're celebrating Pentecost, the coming of the Holy Spirit, our Hebrew brothers and sisters are, are celebrating the giving of the Torah. They happened on the same. They happened on that uh, on that day of Pentecost. So the law basically is broken up into three areas. You have the ceremonial law, the civil law, and the moral law. 
Okay? So under the ceremonial law, you have sacrificial laws. How, how many have read Leviticus? Mm. Isn't that a great book? <laughs> two pigeons and three goats. And, you know, uh, so you got the sacrificial laws, you have the hygiene laws, and I think we shared this before, but one of the reasons why the Jewish folks suffered so much during the plague in Europe was because the Jews had hygiene laws. Like they washed their, and they were keeping themselves clean. They were washing their hands, and all the other people were dirty and getting sick and dying. And so they looked over at the Jewish people going, well, why aren't you guys all sick? Well, one of the reasons why was because they were washing their hands. And they were also, the way they treated their meat, and all of those things were done very through these sacrificial laws. And so they had clean hands, and they had clean food, and so they stuck out like sore thumbs because they weren't dying. And so, of course, then they, they were uh, persecuted. Uh, in this ceremonial laws, we also have the feasts or what I call Elohim's calendar. There's actually two calendars. The Jewish people have two calendars. They have the civil calendar and the sacred calendar. Okay. So, um, so as far as the ceremonial law, the sacrificial laws, and the hygiene laws, and then, of course, you get down to the civil laws, the statutes, judgments, ordinances, the civil calendar. Uh, out of those two areas, the ceremonial and the civil, are, do you think any of those have anything to do with us today? Maybe one, and that's the calendar. Now, I'm going to share this with you, is that uh, when we share, we're sharing from our perspective to the best of my knowledge. This is, this is how I see it. But it's up to us individually to process it within our own hearts and say, well, maybe, maybe not. Or maybe not now. Maybe later. I'm going to put that on the shelf for now and we'll see. But uh, when it comes to the, uh, the Father's calendar, what I have experienced, my testimony, is that there have been significant changes that have happened, interestingly enough, coinciding with his calendar. So when on September 26th, when we moved into the year 5783, uh, something changed, and I felt it, and I knew it, and then these dreams have started coming over the last two weeks, so that, my testimony is such, my experience is such that it makes sense to me that the Father's still working by his calendar, and so I watch those days. Now, the beautiful thing is watching a calendar has nothing to do with do's and don'ts. It doesn't have anything to do with those. It's not constrictive. You know, you want to look at the calendar. It's 5783. But the, that, there's no bondage to that. There's no legalism to that. It doesn't mean I've got to get up and do some kind of ceremony or whatever. It's just a matter of there's the calendar. Interestingly enough, things keep coinciding with his calendar. Hmm, that's a testimony. All right, so then we get down to the civil law. So, Father, so what we've been set free from through Jesus is the sacrificial laws, the hygiene laws, you know, because that's what, when they said to Jesus, you know, they said, well, why, why aren't your disciples washing their hands? They're not washing their hands. You know, when you, the ceremonial way of washing your hand, you, you, get the, you get the water, you get the water in your hand, and you got your hand up here, and you start to wash. And you have to make sure both hands stay up like this as you're washing your hands. You have to ceremonially wash. And it has to, you have to keep your hands up like this because the water, the dirty water, drips off the bottom of your elbow. And so what you got to make sure is that when you're washing your hands, you don't go like this. You know, you know no, we're not clean. So, but when, so one of, that's one of the reasons why they challenged Jesus is because he was not obeying the laws. And guess who wrote the laws? He wrote the laws. <laughs> So I was sharing that uh, when I was in Kuwait, uh, uh, we were in a van, and we had a, a, this officer uh, was uh, sitting, of course, in the front seat uh, <clears throat> with the driver, and we're all packed, and we get up to the gate, and we get up to the gate, and the guy guarding the gate tells us, pull over to the side, and the officer, he, he yells at him and says, we don't have to, and this guy guarding the gate goes, oh, yes, you do, I, I have orders, and the guy, the officer said, I wrote the orders. I also am the one that countermanded them and released and said that, that that order is no longer in place. And this kid just stood there like this scared. He goes, yeah, well, I don't know that. I have orders. Get over there. And so we had to pull over to the side, and he made us get out. And he was like, yes, sir. Yes, sir. And the, the officer was irate. I am the one that wrote the law. 
I'm the one that gave that order. And I'm telling you, it's, it's, I'm, I, I'm setting you free from that order. He goes, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Stand there now, sir, while I search your van. I'm still going to follow orders. Because you, I don't know you from Adam. But the man that wrote the orders was trying to tell him I've set you free from the orders. Well, Jesus is the one that wrote the orders in the first place. So they were, they were challenging him. But he said, do, you, do not think that I came to destroy the law and the prophets. I did not come to destroy them. I came to fulfill them. I am the fulfillment of all of this that, was, that you were doing in anticipation of my arrival. Guess what? I'm here, and now I am going to not destroy them. I'm going to fulfill them. So all of those laws about sacrifice and cleansing and, and food, you know, he, he said, what did he say? He said, it's not what goes into your mouth that defiles you. It's what comes out of your mouth that defiles you. So what he was saying is, what you eat is not what defiles you. And, 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 and it says in some, of the, in some of the Gospels, it says at that moment they realized, he just said, have at it, guys. You want to have a shrimp on the barbie? Go for it. You want to have a nice, some nice bacon? Go for it. That's basically, because he's saying, that's not what defiles you. Yeah. He said, it's what comes out of your mouth. That's why he, that's why he turned to the, to the Pharisees and says, you hypocrites. You, the law says you're supposed to honor your father and mother. But you say everything that I own that could be a blessing to my parents is Corbin. It belongs to God. They said it belongs to God. That's the loophole. That's my way out. So I don't have to give them anything. So did they actually do anything holy or righteous with what they had? No. But, what they, but they said it and it sounded so holy. But it's, it belongs to God. So I can't give it to my parents. And he says, you hypocrites. You bunch of hypocrites. He says, you know. So he called them on it. He said, I came to fulfill the law. But what's fascinating to me, and I, I, I here, listen to this. Whoever, therefore, shall break one of the least of these commandments hmm, and teach others to do so, do so, shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven, but whoever shall do and teach them shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. Whosoever breaks one of the least of these commandments. So there are commandments, there are statutes, there's ordinances, there's the testimonies, there's the sacrificial law, there's all these things. But what did he say? The commandments. I think Father's got a message for us. I think we're still accountable to these Ten Commandments. And we're going to learn more about which each one of them are and what does that mean to us. What does each one of those mean to us? So in the Old Testament, in the Old Covenant, I should say, if you break many of the moral laws, if, if there are not all of them, but there are many of those moral laws. If you broke them, you died. That's it. You know, you're, you know get, get a bunch of rocks and rock them. You're dead, period. But under Jesus, in the New Covenant, mercy and grace, there is no condemnation. And that word condemnation means to death. There is no, there is no, uh, a, there is no sentence of death upon you now because you're in Jesus. Therefore, there is no condemnation or sentence of death. Oh, yeah. yeah. So look at this. Then sin, sin was annually covered up by God, out of God's sight, out of sight. I don't want to look at it. Put the blood over it so they would once a year, we just had it a few days ago, a few were just last week, the week before, was the Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur. What they would do is come in and everybody would be sort of like, here's all the terrible things I've done this year. All right? Here's, I'm going to put some blood over that and we're going to hide it. We're going to get it out of God's view so God doesn't see it and he doesn't judge you and you can go on and live for, for the next year. But, uh, in, in Jesus, it wasn't just covered, it was removed. The blood removes the sin. And interestingly enough, David, one of the things David said, David said, Oh, Father, forgive me of the guilt of my sin. So you hear the language. He, he, he already went to God, God, I, I'm sorry, I blew it, I'm really sorry. But what he had to deal with is the guilt. The sin is taken care of. I know God's forgiven me, 
but I'm still carrying this guilt in my heart, in my soul, weighing me down. And the, so the blood, every year they would come together and, uh, you know, uh, well, we don't lean into stereotypes, but stereotypically in some of the humor you hear where someone within a marriage will remind the other spouse, remember 20 years ago when you did this? You know, I remember the last time you did that. I remember it was 15 years ago, but I remember, and we keep score. Well, this is what they were doing. They would come to the tabernacle on the Day of Atonement, and it's like, hey, remember what you did? You did this, and you did that, and you did the other. For all your life, all of these sins you have done, they were still carrying the guilt of it. But when Jesus comes, not only does he, are we forgiven, but he removes it. Only in him is it completely removed. It is not only forgiven, but it is removed. We pray that you've been blessed during this time of teaching, and we encourage you to watch the second part of this teaching as we are introducing the Ten Commandments. Lord bless you.